Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome back to the second part of the Hedgeye Investing Summit. I'm excited to have this conversation, uh, main, mainly because I've never had a, a real conversation with Mike Green before. Uh, Mike, uh, welcome, and, and, and thanks, thanks for making the time. We appreciate it. Absolutely. A pleasure, Keith. A pleasure to, to have a chance to talk to you for the first time as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's always the best when I have both of my worlds collide. The institutional community of investors say, hey, look, you really got to gotta talk to this guy. And then the Twitterati. I mean, the Twitterati is very good, as you know, at figuring out who's full of shit and who's actually, who actually knows what they're talking about. And most importantly, who, who knows what they're talking about in a specific uh, area of expertise during specific or particular points of market time. And um, you know, me just, you know, you're, you're one of the guys I follow on Twitter, obviously, a very appropriate commentary at points in time where people aren't really thinking about things maybe the same way that you are. Um, so I wanted to maybe start with that, like, so that people could get, uh, get to know you and, and get a little bit about your background and, and, and what it is that is your process, how you think about markets. Well, I assume if you're talking about um, Twitter rising to the top, you're referring to my cooking. But um, I regularly post cooking pics on Twitter. But um, no, so, you know, I've been doing this for a very long time, right, in, in markets in one form or another for roughly 30 years. And what I've kind of carved out as my niche is trying to figure out why people are forced to do something. Um, and dispensing with the typical fundamental narrative that says, something along the lines of, well, energy stocks are going to rally because the price of oil is going higher. And the um, what, what I'm looking for is, is scenarios or situations where I can identify the rules by which people are forced to engage in a transaction. And in an ideal situation, I'm finding a situation where somebody is forced to sell me something when they don't necessarily want to be selling it. Um, or is buying something from me when uh, they're buying it for reasons that are tied to their underlying feature. And mm. so the, the one area that that has kind of led me to um, become a, a spokesman for is the growth of systematic and passive type strategies, understanding the mechanisms by which the rules are constructed, understanding the mechanisms by which those flows hit the market. And that allows me to dispense with some of the narrative that everybody else needs to explain why things are being done, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, why are we seeing small stocks rally? Well, we're seeing small stocks rally because investors had abandoned them over the last couple of years. And as they move to a narrative that says, hey, the economy is recovering, they have to pile money in and there's not going to be any selling by the passive strategies, right? They receive no instruction set. So it creates an inelastic market or a market that responds significantly to that type of price. So that background is is kind of the only significant claim to fame that uh, that I would suggest, and uh, it's been gratifying to see people find it a valuable perspective on platforms like Twitter, Real Vision, or now uh, Hedgeye. Yeah, yeah, systematic versus passive. I mean, guys, if you pop up slide four, and like we always start with this whenever I attempt to give uh, a macro or rate of change presentation, and it really is the dominance and, and the respect of the machine. I don't know if you can see that, but we're showing. You know, the, just the flow of it all. Like when you and I started in this business, obviously the flow was eclipsed by uh, hedge funds having more capital than you know than what is now passive. I know you have different, you have definitely uh, definitions you want to make clear on passive investing. But the per, you know, I'm constantly fascinated with how quickly the machine perpetuates a move that's a new, and then forces, like you said, forces the hand. And I think that this year's move. You know, in January, on you know high short interest stocks as a factor exposure, for example, was a was a just an obvious example of that. Yep. So maybe if you can kind of like bite on that and, and and talk that through a bit. Sure. So so heavily shorted stocks have actually been running you know largely since um, uh, uh, late March of last year, but right. really that pace accelerated following November of last year and kind of hit an apex in January. Right. So it. it I would argue you had an element of a blow off move in, in, in heavily shorted stocks in January. What has changed in that type of environment um, it, or in the vi environment today that's facilitating that type of move is historically you would have sourced shares that you were shorting from a prime broker who would have obtained it from a long only mutual fund investor. That long only mutual fund investor would have had some form of an expected return framework that would say when GameStop goes from $5 to $20 having quadrupled, that suggests that it's overvalued and future returns should be lower, right? And so a natural supply is created when a stock price goes up 
um, from those who had bought it at lower prices to selling it out. What happens when passive becomes a sizable component of the market, around 40% of the shares of GameStop are held by passive players in one form or another, they receive no price signal, right? They receive no information when the <laughs> stock price goes up to $20 from $5. And as a result, they aren't willing to make those shares available for you. And it's further complicated by the fact that the borrowing now increasingly occurs from those very passive players. So the largest short um, security lending is coming out of BlackRock and Vanguard. It has now eclipsed the size of the business that would come from most prime brokers. And because they are not running it in a fashion that is designed to quote unquote optimize that, instead they're running it at a very, very large scale, we don't receive the historical signals of rising cost of shorting until it's kind of too late. And so, you know, the Melvin Capitals of the world, they get caught on the wrong side of having sold calls on a GameStop um, and simultaneously shorted it. Um, it. You know, that sort of um, blow up was driven by this changing market structure, right? That's, that's how I interpret what occurred. Yeah, and there, there's a there's a change in that component of the structure, but there's also just the machine on the passive side perpetuating, you know, the structure. Forty percent is a massive number. You know, how do you how do you um, nail down or even try to nail down these big components? Like when you bucket what is passive versus active, what is systematic versus um, other, and, and the retail component with all these new participants. Right. Like how do you how do you think about that? So the retail component's a little bit harder, but anytime you can pull up, and, and of course, you know, I have the premium subscriptions to Bloomberg and everything else that make it more difficult for a retail investor to follow this. But from a institutional standpoint, in my opinion, the very first place that you want to be looking in terms of the characteristic of a company is who owns it, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to dig in and you want to understand, okay, Vanguard and BlackRock are very straightforward and obvious. State Street is another player that's involved there. Then you start getting into geode capital. You start getting into the Northern Trust. You start getting into what fraction of fidelity is actually systematic versus discretionary. Um, and so you need to kind of build the characteristics up on each of the larger stocks. Now, I, I do that for a limited group of individual stocks. Um, working on ways to expand that in terms of the universe and others are actually probably ahead of me at this point on some of those dynamics. But that sort of characterization is pretty straightforward. The other thing that you got to be very, very careful about in the statistics for passive and the share of passive is that is it, it's two vanguards and BlackRock's incentive to minimize that share. And mm -hmm. so what we're typically getting when we're told the passive share is ETF share or we're given mutual fund passive share. There's an entire additional layer of passive strategies that would include things like total return swaps against index structures, um, or um, what are referred to as uh, commingled investment trust CITs, which are non-regulated, not, not non-regulated, but non-registered mutual funds that are available for even lower costs to many institutions. Um, there's also strategies that have a tremendous amount of um, passive overlap, for example, futures, right, would have a, an S&P 500 future would have a passive type component to it. CTAs that are involved in trend following would be using passive type strategies. And so you just have to be very careful in terms of incorporating the data. And that's one of the hardest things about this industry. And I would suggest it's a huge story as we head into 2021 is we're used to the data being relatively high quality. Um, it obviously requires an awful lot of work to process yep. and understand that data. But I would argue on the macro side, for example, like we're getting an awful lot of information that is irrevocably, I think the technical term is screwed up <laughs> by the dynamics of the pandemic, right? How, how do we seasonally adjust anymore? Do we just discard what happened in 2020? Yeah. And how do we think about the recovery in 2021? Do we also discard that? How do we think about things like savings rates, et cetera? Like, so we're in an interesting position. Others drew the analogy um, a year or two ago that said, you know, some variant of, you know, you should be looking to emerging market type analysts who are used to operating in a data vacuum, right? And who understand that the data that they receive in terms of the macro signals are often very flawed. Um, I would suggest that we have to be very thoughtful about how we interpret the data that we're receiving today.
Yeah, right? the, the same type of framework. You have, I mean, you have the data that you think is the right data, and then you have the volatility of the market and what you know what percentage of the market are certain players in 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 those critical periods of clock time, or as you know John Boyd would say, in that OODA loop, in that very specific yep. moment that you are either the force seller in you know in your um, in your words or the force buyer. I think about that all the time. I mean, I'm constantly remodeling, remodeling. I've used a lot of different things, like the rescaled range process that that was you know publicly available from Mandelbrot. People ask me about it all the time. I'm like, no, I'm not giving you my model, but but that really <laughs> is that really is where I live. Like, I'm constantly just trying to figure that out. Um, is that your experience too? Well, I, yes. And so you know, people hear me talk about this all the time. Um, I'm actually incredibly excited by where we are in financial history, right? So we're, in my opinion, approaching the, um, I did a Grant Williams interview on, on something called the end game, right? So he had a podcast called the end game. And I, I highlighted at that point that there is no end game, but I do think that we're actually approaching the end game for some of the nonsense around, you know, the efficient market hypothesis, sharp ratios, modern portfolio theory, et cetera all of which are predicated on this idea of um, functionally structural stability in markets, right? That they have an ergodic, what's referred to as an ergodic feature to them, where at any point in time, um, the distribution in the future is going to be replicable by doing an ensemble average. So if I run a thousand simulations, yep. I'm gonna get the same result as if I do um, an individual investing a thousand times, right? All of the models and tools that we've built up over the last 70 years in the business are built on this flawed premise, right? And it's just, it's, it, it, we hear it in the terms we use, right? Monte Carlo simulations, mm -hmm. right? So a Monte Carlo simulation means something because we're actually suggesting that we can obtain a profile of the risk of our portfolio by taking the historical distribution and then running that through a random process, right? A randomizing process to determine a series of scenarios that ostensibly model how the market is going to behave going forward based on how it's behaved in the past. Well, that works if you're playing a game of dice because the distribution for a six-sided die is always going to be the same. If I roll it a thousand times, it's gonna give almost exactly the same distribution as if a thousand people roll it at the same time. That's not how investing works because everything is conditional on what came before it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I gen and it's true for economics as well. Right. People hear me all the time talk about um, Ole Peters, and I really strongly encourage people to read his work. It's accessible Excellent. and very powerful. Um, but we're at the cusp of another revolution. Um, and it's not Bitcoin, by the way, but um, we're, you know, we're at the cusp of another revolution in economics that I think is actually going to be just as powerful as the breakthroughs, quote, you know, air quotes that we had in the Great Depression in terms of the introduction of, you know, the theories of Keynes and the general theory of markets, et cetera, and equilibrium. Um, I think we're on the edge of changing that. I mean, I'm really excited about it. I am too. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's actually crazy, I think, that this is one of the few professions, um, you know, profession, highly paid professions, let, let's call it that, that has not succumbed to nonlinearity. You know, it, it's crazy that people are modeling things using, you know, normal distributions, everything that you just rattled off and not yep. using fractal patterns, not using power laws, not using like the, re the whole bloody world has figured this out other than Wall Street. Well, yes and no. Right. I mean, first of all, remember, we're a vocational, you know, we, we have I literally went to a vocational school, right? The world's most expensive, most prestigious vocational school at the Wharton School of Business. Right. But like my undergraduate education consisted of here's how you calculate cap M, here's how you value <laughs> options in the Black Scholes formulation, right? And at every point in that, like I, because I had a background in physics and and you know a, a, a reasonable level of math skills, I just kept looking at it and going, well, well, these are all assumptions, right? At some point, do we start to challenge these assumptions and move beyond this? And the answer is no, because let's just be frank, we're you know while we attract rocket scientists into our industry rarely do we get that combination of rocket scientists and individuals who are really trying to theoretically understand what's being modeled, right? right? It becomes a computational exercise as compared to a theoretical exercise under many situations. 
And because the math is really hard, the people that can stand up in front of people and talk rarely have those skills. And so, you, you know, we're all familiar with the line, I think the movie was Margin Call, you know, explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old or a golden retriever. That's what dominates the market. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, there, there's some like just bloody, you know, talk about bloody, just bloody disasters in terms of simplifications. I mean, it, think about a simple moving average. I mean, yep. a simple, at, at, at a bare minimum, use an exponential moving average. Like use something that will pick up what's happening in the now. And whether you look at local volatility or, you know, you know gather all we call it instantaneous volatility, it, to me, that's the, that's the place where the practitioner in me lives. And I wonder what you think about that. Because what you just said separates the difference between an academic and a doer. And, yeah. and this is why the Mad Major, or John Boyd, redefined you know, the U.S. Air Force and then the Navy SEALs is because he actually just got in there and did it from a pilot's perspective. What do you think yeah. about that? No, I, I think that's absolutely true. Was, um, so I, you know, I was on the path of getting my Ph.D. in finance and literally just became disgusted, right, where it was like, wait a second, you're literally telling me it's assumptions all the way down, right? And nobody who has done this, I mean, you, you know, full respect to Bill Sharp and to um, – Harry Markowitz for their contributions to the industry and the insights. But remember that those insights that they published and turned into Nobel prizes and now largely govern the vast majority of activity in our industry were written by a couple of 25 year olds who'd never traded a security in their life. <laughs> oh, they eventually did. And that ended up uh, in quite an interesting uh, drawdown, but <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, that's, I mean, yes, correct. They eventually did. Their genius was, you know, was highlighted as this is how, how it's supposed to work. But I mean, that's that people don't understand. That is what literally governs our industry, right? I mean, that's why it's so impressive when you look at the growth of a platform like Vanguard and say, holy cow, this is all wrong, but everybody does it. Yeah. Well, I mean, this, this, is, you know, this is why you're so excited about it. I mean, and, and, it's, and, it's why I'm so excited. And it also creates a terrifying situation because the presumption is that if somebody is doing something wrong, you can step in and apply the rules of arbitrage against it. The problem is for it to, um, for you to be able to do that, you have to time it almost perfectly. Yeah, well, I, 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 and, and it's the same. Thesis. That's that's no different than you know the Mad Major himself being engaged in a dogfight against a MIG. I mean, Correct. you have that much time to make a world class decision, and you have a lot of information to do it. But can you can you maintain your behavioral composure? Uh, I've had I don't know if you know Buddy Carter or not. Um, I don't know. Uh, but... for, former Goldman uh, currency guru, uh, and, and and he's. He always, he, he calls what, like at least part of what I do, um, operating against the uninformed volume. You know, on the yeah. edges of the risk range. Are you selling at the top end of the range? Are you buying at, I'm using a very basic example, are you buying at the bottom end of the range? And I do think that timing matters. I mean, there, there are points, in, and I wanted to hit on this too with you, because you do have uh, explicit views on liquidity relative to your view on what is passive and what is not passive. Yep. And, and liquidity is an opportunity. I mean, you have an opportunity yep. to transact. What I see uh, from institutional hedge fund managers uh, this year in particular are drawdowns where they're all the uninformed volume and force volume on the downside at the same time. We, we, we've all, I mean, I, I think it's a poor analogy because I don't think the systems are the same, but we've all sat at a blackjack table next to somebody who takes a hit on 16 with a dealer showing, <laughs> you, you know, a four, right? And you literally turn to me like, why, why would you do that? <laughs> right? And you've now screwed up the deck for everybody else at the table, right? I mean, that's it. I, I can just imagine the guys at Melvin Capital sitting there going, why would you do that? What, what are you doing? You're driving the price of GameStop to 450. Like, this is insane, right? So yes, they're sitting on the wrong side of the uninformed capital, but that doesn't change the fact that they didn't diagnose the distribution of possible outcomes incorrectly. Yeah. Well, hey, to be clear, I didn't, I didn't say that the masses or the machine is the uninformed volume. I actually mean, I, I think you that did. what's happening right. now is the, the, in many cases, the promise of running with net neutrality and pure alpha coming out your ears is the uninformed, you know, is the uninformed <laughs> volume. And because we've had, you know, this year we've had three, what I would define as three episodic and non-trending vol spikes or volatility yep. spikes. And, and largely they had almost exclusively had to do with explicit positionings. Long, you know, short, short high, short interest stocks was the first one. Then it was long momentum, low beta, 
uh, low beta momentum, large cap, and then and then this most recent one was the rates rotation. But they're yep. all just they're all they're all people hitting on sixes together. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I I think that's exactly correct. And that sort of positioning dynamic, um, you know, one of the hard parts about asset management is that you can go in with the most informed position, but just like a butterfly flapping their wings in a chaotic system in a weather system can, you know, quote, obviously it's an, it's an exaggeration, but can cause a hurricane across the world. If you miss just that one, that one component of the state, things can move very hard against you in the opposite direction. And this is one of the real challenges to things like empirical finance is that remember, almost everybody sees the same data that you do, right? Like if you're running your information sets off of a moving average, whether it's exponential or simple moving averages, that is broadly available to everyone. And so your action has to be thought of not in the context of, I see something that everybody else doesn't, right? But instead has to be thought of in the, you know, um, I know you know what I think you know sort of framework. And yeah, yeah. therefore, I'm going to bet that you're going to do X when I think the right choice is to do Y, right? And sometimes you'll be wrong. And and that is like that is by far the hardest part of this business because you're supposed to be contrarian. You're supposed to figure out, you know, what is going to happen next. And sometimes you'll be wrong and you just need to accept that. And so um, that's hard. That's really hard for people to do. And, yeah. and I, I don't envy your position because you are often dealing with investors who look to you for certainty and you know that there is a stochastic distribution around the possible outcomes. Go back to the MIG example, right? If the MIG turns left and you thought probabilistically the right, you know, the expected behaviorism for, to go right and you tried to anticipate that, you got to wait for another setup, right? Mm -hmm. um, you don't get that shot that time. Um, and that's really, you know, I think people struggle with that because they want people to have 100% batting averages and it's just not realistic. Well, I mean, I, this is an industry that's it's, hard. it's not even realistic if you are very new to the game and you think the game is quite literally still played the way that Billions de depicts it. You know, what is the definition of certainty? How certain yeah. are you? Yeah. Very certain. I mean, inside it, you could have inside information, quite literally, inside information on what the company is going to say in three weeks and have a 10% drawdown of your capital being on the side of that inside information illegally. I mean, it's, 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 it's an amazing thing to watch. <laughs> and um, you see a lot of frustration in the game associated with that. Um, but I want to get back to like what I think the, one of the main points that you're making here is. The hedge fund industry in particular was built on the concept, go back to that slide four, that we, we have more capital and we can push our ideas in our capital. And that actually worked for a period of time. If I go back to when I started at uh, Dawson Sandberg, the, the correlation between uh, the hedge fund industry as an index and the S&P 500 was like 0.2. Now it's like 0.9. Some days it's like 0.99. It <laughs> looks like nope. that anyway. Um, so what is it about our industry? And I often say this about myself. I had the lowest SAT score at Yale. That's a huge competitive advantage because I'm not the person who's sitting there believing the Yale Econ Department on these bloody CAPM models and equilibriums. You know, so I tried doing it my own way. And, and yeah. I wonder how much of this is people have never had a test wrong in their life. You know, they're 4.0, they're, they're, and then they get out there into either officialdom, which is even scarier, the policymakers, or God forbid, then they go to the buy side and they're operating on these, these intellectual linear assumptions. What, what do you think about that versus, you know, somebody like me? Well, um so first of all, um, congratulations on getting the lowest SAT score at Yale. That is an accomplishment <laughs> and an advantage. Um, Thank you. <laughs> the, um, the second thing that, that I would say on that is, so I, I think that there's two components to it. One is, um, if you actually pulled up that chart again, one of the things that you'd see is the growth of the hedge fund business over the time period from basically 1999 until roughly 2010, yep. right? And flows create their, this is one of the key points that I would highlight. And there's some academic papers that are beginning to come out and tell us this, and you know this, and anyone who actually has ever traded, you know, anything over a retail size account understands that flows determine outcomes, right? And market is a, it, it is the measure of transactions. It's not actually a measure of information. That's a theory about it, but it's, um, it's actually measuring transactions. And those flows create their own reinforcement. And so when money was flowing into hedge funds, 
the long short strategies worked really well. Why? Because everybody was looking at the same thing and saying, okay, I want to go long this because it has improving prospects. And I want to go short this because it has deteriorating prospects or I think it's too richly valued. And everybody talked amongst themselves as you see in the billions type framework and that created a reinforcing dynamic that caused that actual outcome to occur, right? It caused cheap stocks to go up and expensive stocks to go down. And a long short hedge fund is creating synthetic supply by shorting shares, right? That was the polar opposite of what happened over the period from give or take 1995 to 2000, where the market was propelled upwards by momentum strategies, where anyone who shorted found themselves incapable of sourcing shares to, um, to, to cover, right? particularly in the high flying tech stuff, the Julian Robertson shutting down in March 2000 sort of framework. Uh, and so I, I would actually just highlight that a large part of what happens is that the narratives become reinforcing, right? Markets only go up 90, you know, 90 to 1999 sort of framework and every opportunity is something to be bought and oh, the solution set is, hey, we should be buying technology names. And then hedge funds, of course, outperform because they are running long short in the aftermath of that environment where the markets correct sharply. They attract capital that creates a positive feedback loop where the more attractive stocks get bought and the less attractive stocks get sold. The hedge funds in general have emerged in an environment in which tech stocks crashed. And so they are negatively predisposed to hedge funds or to tech stocks, right? The high flying tech things. And everybody's couched themselves in a framework that says, hey, I'm a Ben Graham fundamentalist and I do my research and Joel Greenblatt showed me this little book that beats the market. And I've read securities analysis by Ben Graham and, and you know, here's my DCF. I mean, you, you remember going to these meetings in 2006, 2007, where an analyst would show up at an idea dinner and have, you know, 15 pages of spreadsheet calculation showing how they had recalculated the weighted average cost of capital and discounted cash flows, et cetera. And they had all this information and all this analysis that had been done. And all of that's gone today because nobody in their right mind would say, hey, well, the weighted average cost of capital is determining how successful this company is, right? It becomes this narrative of, um, well, uh, the Green New Deal is coming and therefore we're going to buy all solar stocks. And because the Green New Deal is coming, we're going to buy all the copper stocks. And because the Green New Deal is coming, we're going to buy all the electric vehicle stocks, right? It's totally thematic again in the same way that it was in the 1990s. And it's just a cycle, mm -hmm. right? It just, it, 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 it recreates itself. And retail tends to do better under, you know, they, they tend to gravitate to the Peter Lynch, buy what you know sort of stuff or where you think you have an edge. And when you have this positive feedback loop of the market becoming more and more thematic, it's going to continue until it breaks. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 like history would say, and unless it's different this time, that those what we call quad two conditions perpetuate the storytelling. You know, the better no. the storytelling, the higher the beta on that, the smaller the cap on that, the better. And as long as the thing goes up, that's fine. And then mm -hmm. when that quad economic quadrant changes and inflation starts to slow and growth on a real basis starts to slow, you know, you, know, you see the tide roll out and see what people really have on. So. Uh, I'm not so concerned about that part. I, I, I'm like really interested in the still the front end part of it. So when you're in this and you're looking for force selling, force buying, like what do you see today? Like what are some of the, the bigger opportunities on either side of that you know, today? Because you, I mean, you follow all of it. So go yeah. anywhere. So um, you know, today is unfortunately a little bit self validating on this, but um, I, I would suggest the narrative that I'm most uh, that I think has the greatest opportunity is to fade the reflation thesis. Okay. And um, I would suggest that that narrative has emerged um, as explanatory power of what we've seen in the aftermath of the pandemic, right? So um, it's almost exactly a year ago today, it was uh, March 26th that we put it out. On our website, logicafunds.com, you can access uh, this piece we wrote, um, Policy in a World of Pandemic, Social Media, et cetera. And in that piece, what we um, suggested was that the markets were going to do exactly what they had been doing before, which is very quickly rally back and move to new all-time highs because of the dynamics of how passive investing works. Um, and so, you know, a year on, that looks like a pretty good call most people are very uncomfortable accepting that. And so they want to look for a fundamental reason why something is happening. And the narrative that they immediately seize on is, well, Fed printer goes burr, 
And we know periods of historic money printing and fiscal largesse create uh, inflationary conditions. And the US dollar is collapsing, collapsing, I tell you, um, falling to new all time lows. Although ironically, if you look at the trade weighted dollar, it's closer to all time highs. Um, and that narrative is, in my view at least, largely built around the bullwhip effect and shortages that emerge following a pandemic where the world tries to restart. And I encouraged people last year on Twitter, um, roughly around April, May, to play a game simulation that's available from MIT called the beer game, mm -hmm. right? And it's a very simple model of a complex dynamic system that allows you to understand these bullwhip effects, right? And so. Yeah. As demand reappeared and production was curtailed for things like lumber or things like paper, we saw this with paper towels and toilet paper, you know, the initial impact is everybody tries to stock up on toilet paper, which leads to toilet paper stockouts, which leads to people buying more toilet paper when they can find the toilet paper. And meanwhile, there's a giant stockpile of that really thin, terrible toilet paper that you use when you go to a restaurant. Right, but none of the really nice fluffy stuff that you keep in your own house, right? And the supply chain needs to reorient itself and move back to that. And that creates you know, um, a lag in the supply chain that then creates the perception of shortages. And this whole process feeds on itself until it breaks because the cure for high prices and commodities is high prices. We actually, um, uh, let me see if I can show this here. Can I share my screen? Uh, can we? Uh, no. Let me let me show. Um, I don't think we can. Uh, we probably can't. Um, yeah. I'll I'll send it. You can post it up later. But um, we actually just put in our monthly letter a picture that looks at the dynamics of the change in commodity prices relative to commodity curve backwardation. Yep. And you know, if we go back a year ago, commodity curves were in massive contango. Right, so contango means that the forward price is higher than the current price. Um, what that is telling you is, is that there's a surplus in spot, right? Surplus, there's tons of oil and gas available. There was so much oil that we couldn't find storage for it. And because it's a toxic substance, the price had to go negative to incentivize people to find places to store it. Um, today, all those commodity curves have flipped, right? And the spot is higher than the forward, indicating there are no shortages in the future. Right? There is no outrageous demand from the Green New Deal for copper that is causing you know, the need for copper prices to rise to $6 in the future to incentivize production and warehousing and all this. Like, it's just the evidence is not there to support these statements. Um, instead, what we see is a pattern of backwardation that suggests that the next move in commodity prices is actually lower. What's, um, what's interesting about that within what you're looking for, I mean, backwardation almost definitively is forced buying. I mean, that's basically after yep. the move. And what I look for there, and interestingly today in my top three, top three things was copper was my first you know, signal of the beginning of the end, potentially in copper, which is a, a lower high uh, within yep. the construct of backwardation, which used to be raging contango. That, that's definitely interesting. Um, I, I still, I gotta get to some of other people's questions. I could, sounds like yep. I could ask you questions like all afternoon, this is awesome. Um, and by the way, that uh, the beer game, which I know very well as a, as a Canadian hockey player, um, is, <laughs> is in a book called The Fifth Discipline, Peter Sange, who, who goes through that. And, and for those of you that want to kind of get into the way that it sounds like um, it sounds like Mike and I agree, nonlinearity and how to build a learning organization you know, of that ilk, that's a great book that goes through the beer game uh, as well. Um, first question, this one's got a lot of votes. Um, Mike, in a recent interview on Real Vision, you stated that Bitcoin, of course the first question, I didn't look, but, but I could have guessed. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Mike, in a recent interview on Real Vision, you stated that Bitcoin is going to zero based on information you had that you could not reveal it. Uh, do you still feel that way? And if so, can you reveal this information? Sorry, if, if, if the, you don't want to answer that, don't, don't worry about it. I, I, I'm just uh, so, so first of all, what I said was that um, there was information that I could not reveal. I did not suggest that Bitcoin was going to go to zero on the basis of that information. What I said was that there was very clear evidence that the regulatory framework was less favorable than people thought it was. And I continue to believe that's the case. I think it's fascinating that you're seeing significant actions against entities like Binance, um, BitMEX, et cetera. And people are treating it as if it is nothing, 
Mm. Right. Um, you know, hey, Tether settled with the SDNY. Um, you know, that's treated as as the green light that everything's fine. But, you know, the simple reality is we don't know the story behind that. Right. What we know is Bitfinex has actually announced that they, you know, that the, the SDNY used incredibly strong language. They lied. They misrepresented. Right. Um, we know the Department of Justice is currently involved in investigations in these areas. Relying on Gary Gensler or Janet Yellen to be super favorable to Bitcoin, I think, is a mistake. Mm -hmm. And um, I, in, in just the simplest form, I think people have viewed Bitcoin as similar to an Uber or an Airbnb or even a YouTube where failing to obtain the appropriate regulatory licenses and approvals and permissions is perceived as a feature rather than a bug because it becomes so large that the system has to adopt it. And the scale, you hear this explicitly referred to, if we can get the scale of Bitcoin up large enough, then the government will have to adopt it. No, they don't actually, mm. right? Um, and a trillion dollars is not really that big of a deal. It's half an Apple, right? Um, if Apple were to go away or to go bankrupt, would it create the end of the world? No. Absolutely not. And so I, I continue to think that people are misunderstanding the dynamics of Bitcoin. We're in an environment, again, to go back to the narrative where when the number goes up, people assume that means it's working and it's better. Hmm. And I would just simply highlight that things like retail transactions, the actual use of Bitcoin has fallen for the past four years. It is used less today than it was used four years ago. That's not a successful product, right? Now you can tell me it's because it's a store of value and who would possibly sell their Bitcoin? But let's I mean, part of the dynamic, you've been doing this long enough, I've been doing this long enough. My objective is not to get people to sell their Bitcoin. My objective is to actually interject a dose of reality into it and to say, hey, wait a second, just because the number's going up now doesn't mean this is actually working. Well, I think, I mean, that is cleanly the difference between guys like you and I, and, and, and for, unfortunately we're in low supply. Uh, where we're not evangelists of a certain asset or store of value and you know, cling to everything. I see people, I mean, former famed hedge fund managers who couldn't get anything right in macro for years. That's all they do. Now that's just one thing. Now all I do is, is crypto and they just, it's just one way, um, you know, which I don't, I don't find to be all that enlightening. But um, at the end of the day, th thanks for having the, you know, uh, you know, for having the spine to say it. Now you're going to get ripped by whoever on Twitter. But uh, uh, that's, that's <laughs> who okay. I get, believe me, I'm. Uh, I've got I'm, teenage kids. <laughs> getting ripped by you know random people over Twitter is is nothing compared to having teenagers. <laughs> I love that. Uh, Michael Latham from uh, Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, interesting Twitter post the other day, Mike, regarding how you find a sustained value rally to be bigger on rhetoric than in actuality, especially going forward. Curious to hear if, if you think FANG, semis, or other momentum-led growth stocks will lead the market to new highs in its ultimate bull leg. So that's my bias. Um, I, I, the point that I'm making for people is in a structural market where money flows into things like the Vanguard Total Market Index, the Vanguard Total Market Index is constructed on a market value or more accurately, a float-weighted methodology. And so what that means is for each incremental dollar that comes in, um, it's going to be allocated on the basis of the market cap or again, the adjusted market cap for float um, on that particular day. And yep. so it rewards securities that go up with incremental allocations of capital as inflows occur. Part of what has happened in the last year is people have, they initially had to abandon the smaller and value oriented securities that many um, active managers own. As, as I highlighted in the piece that I referred to earlier, policy in a world of pandemics, that was not a passive crash, that was an active manager crash, people abandoning positions in the expectation that there was going to be a significantly negative recession. Um, when, um, when that began to reverse itself, you saw huge inflows into things like the XLE energy ETF. And I would just encourage people to look at the shares outstanding for something like that. They mm -hmm. have exploded. Again, I wish I could share the, the chart that shows this, but if you look at the shares outstanding for that or for many value series, uh, value ETFs or for small cap ETFs, 
you've seen people try to rotate into an area where they think they have the story, they think they have the explanation. And, you know, people point to XLE versus um, XLE versus the NASDAQ. The problem with value strategies in particular is that the way that they are constructed, they inevitably sell that momentum. And so um, if a stock goes up, right? So GameStop, for example, I believe is now the largest stock in the Russell 2000 value. Yeah, it is. Right. Okay. That's absurd. We know it's not a value stock and we know that the Russell rebalance in June is going to kick it out. Right. And it will then have to be sold by all those people that bought the value index, thinking that they were buying into a value story. But what they really bought was a short covering story. Right. And it's going to move into the relatively uh, into the relative wasteland of mid caps and nobody's going to care. Right. And so the value cycle, as long as the base buying is going into things like the Vanguard total market index that have this momentum bias, when people pile into value strategies, they're inevitably setting up the selling of the winners. And it has a negative momentum bias. It currently is moving slightly positive because it, there's an extended time period between the rebalancing. But that's exactly what we saw in 2016 as well, right? We saw this value recovery that just runs out of steam. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we'll see the same thing. That's um, enlightening, I'm sure, for a lot of people. Uh, last question, just because that's all I have time for. But you're, the questions here, man, I, I, I got to give you, you know, a hat tip for this because it, it covers so much, and um, not everyone can do that. Uh, Again, I have teenagers, so. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I only have one. I, get, I don't know if I'm looking forward to all three of my daughters being teenagers. I, I don't. No. It's not a good time. Yeah, They're I, wonderful, but it's not a good time. Seems, Go ahead. It seems like it's going to be a nonlinear time in my life. Uh, yeah, it will. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this one has to do with China, uh, which I haven't no. asked you about yet. Apologies for that. Uh, uh, Dave in California. Michael, uh, what are your thoughts on how Blinken and Biden have handled China so far? And should investors think about Chinese equities? How, how should they think about them over the next couple of years? So, I mean, look, this is a hard one. And um, I, I'm, I'm loath to be overly critical of the Biden administration or overly, um, and I certainly don't want to be particularly complimentary of the, the Trump administration. Um, I think the China dynamic is probably going to be the single most important story that we're dealing with for the next couple of years. I think passive is a bigger, you know, aggregate story. But the what feels to me like the broad misunderstanding and the, the, the hope that is projected onto China, that it is it is a government that, quote unquote, has figured it out that, you know, um, many people may have seen Bill Maher talk about China as, you know, China gets it done. China knows, you know, what it's doing, et cetera. Um, it's very easy for um, centrally planned or totalitarian systems to direct an impulse. And um, systems like ours are inevitably sloppy and messy. And um, Winston Churchill said it well, the Americans will do the right thing after having exhausted all possibilities. China tries to do the right thing, but then by virtue of its structure is forced to ignore the signals of excess. And um, my sense is, is that, that China is a critically flawed structure. I think if you look at the broader signals in terms of demographics, what you're seeing with China is a pulse in terms of um, the success built on its integrate integration within the global economy. It has misinterpreted that as a sign of destiny. Um, and as its population retreats over the next 50, 60 years, its impact on the globe is going to retreat. Um, whether that happens in a positive framework where it's allowed to happen quietly or whether it requires a hugely negative event, my biases were heading towards that hugely negative event. And, um, the Biden administration, I think, is trying to be um, calmer about that engagement than I would like them to be. I, I would suggest the risks of things like Taiwan are much greater than is currently being priced into the market. Hmm. It's, a, it's always great when you, you have a, an experienced pro you know, speak calmly about topics like that, because, you know, again, we live in this age of, of exaggeration and, and, again, people evangelizing over things where... Like, I think this conversation, at least the initial one that we've had, and again, thanks for having it, is, is just like, it's kind of conversation that you'd have uh, if no one was looking. You know, it's reasonable. There's no, like, you know, we're not, we don't have to use expletives, and, and, and it's, it's good. I think, I think I'm going to get a lot of great feedback on that, and um, 
thanks again for doing it, and, we, and we'd love to have you again. I would appreciate that, and, and thank you very much. It was a pleasure getting the chance to talk. Awesome. Thank you. He, he is indeed Mike Green, and, and I'm telling you, I have uh, half a page of other topics that I could talk to Mike Green about, and he's informed with his own process addressing all of them. Uh, thanks for joining us for that one. Up next, Grant Williams. Thank you.